Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshops, where we get together in the middle of the week, and for some of us, the middle of the day, and we do a lot more learning about technology and different topics. Today, we're excited because we have three sort of different presentations going on today, and uh, we're going to learn a lot about a number of different things. First off, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Gabe Goldberg. Gabe is an advisor for APCUG. He has the Region 2 at the east coast of the country. And hey. uh, he has an excellent program that he's going to tell you about and a deal that he has. So I'm going to turn things over to Gabe, and he's going to talk about hard disk sentinel. Hi, let me get set up to start sharing my screen. How's that? Can everybody see my first title slide? You're doing well. Okay, that's a good start. One out of 14 or so to go. Uh, hard Disk Sentinel is a complicated program, but it really has one function. It's to monitor and protect data. Uh, people who've been using PCE for a long time have seen evolution through uh, several different storage media, starting from cassette cartridges to five and a quarter inch floppies, three and a half inch floppies, uh, onto hard drives, rotating drives, and most recently SSDs, solid state drives, which are increasingly replacing rotating memory. They're faster, uh, they, their prices have come down substantially. They're often now what's found in new computers. Both hard drives and SSDs are really taken for granted. You buy a computer and you turn it on and it runs and it does things, and uh, it will reliably and rapidly save and fetch data until at some point, sooner, later, maybe never, but uh, too often, eventually, something goes wrong. The goal of Hard Disk Sentinel is to let you know before there's a problem so that you can take preventive action uh, and avoid any, any real catastrophes. I use it on two computers. I have it on my tower computer desktop system, and it's on my wife's laptop. What it lets me do is constantly monitor the drive health. Uh, we're all used to the check engine light in your car, which is binary. It's either off, which is good, or on, which is either bad or very bad. Uh, Hard Disk Sentinel gives you much more detail than just a perfect or terrible uh, trade-off between status. It can report ultra details on the structure and operation of hard drives and SSDs. It supports rotating memory, solid state drives, hybrid drives, which are rotating memory plus an SSD cache. It supports memory cards, thumb drives, even RAID controllers. Uh, I'll go through several slides showing the display for hard disk set. Well, I have it configured. Uh, you can see the taskbar uh, uh, notification area down at the bottom of, of this slide. That's from my desktop system. I have it configured. You can see where there's a cherry green 93 and a cherry green 95. Those are reporting on the status of the two storage drives that I have on my tower computer. The green shows that the temperature is in a healthy range, uh, especially when a drive is getting very busy the temperature will go up and the status will change to orange. And if it goes too high, if it goes beyond what's a reasonable limit, it will go up and it will, it will turn red. If I mouse over the number, if I mouse over the temperature display, I get that little pop out that's down at the bottom that shows that my disk number one, which is Western Digital, um, is okay. It's telling me the hard disk temperature is 93 which is fine for the drive, and it's telling me the health is 100%, which is exactly where you want it to be. This first bullet here is the summary from the status display for the hard drive. That's the text that I copied. 
And that's exactly what you want to see. It's a plain English summary, and it says the drive is perfect. Nothing wrong was found. There were no errors. You can relax. No action is taken. Even if you see that, and especially if you don't, you can drill down further through a number of different displays to see much more detail on what the drive is doing. That's the main display for an SSD, solid state device. You can see in that green box in the middle, that's where I quoted uh, the information on the previous slide. And this summarizes all of the information about the drive. If you look over on the left, where there were the two, two green check marks, that's telling me about the two different drives that I have. The Seagate Barracuda is the SSD that's installed inside the tower. And the Western Digital Drive below that is an external hard drive that I use for backups. And below that are the charts showing how much space is free and how much is occupied on the two drives. Moving over to the right, you can see that it's telling me how long the SSD has been powered on. It's telling me a very cheerful uh, forecast for the estimated lifetime, more than a thousand days. And it's telling me how many writes, how much data has been written to the drive since I first turned it on. And I'll come back to that number because that's important. And below that, you can see the chart for the temperature, or I'm sorry, for the health of the drive. And that's now down to 99%. And I'll talk about that in relation to how much data has been written to the drive in just a bit. My previous system, my Windows 7 system, was having trouble with the solid state drive. Something in Windows was pounding on the SSD and writing to it without end. SSDs have a certain lifetime. They have a certain number of writes that they can support before you can't use the drive anymore. And while I was using hard disk set to monitor the health of that drive, about every 10 days, the health of the drive decreased by 1%. And that's much too fast. I never did find out why Windows 7 was pounding on the drive so much, but hard disk Sentinel was serving as a doomsday clock. And every 10 or 12 days, it would remind me that the health had decreased by 1%. And the health of a drive is not like a bank account that you can overdraw. When it gets to zero, you're done. That drive is none, done. You won't lose the data, but you can't use it for writing anymore. So what I've done on the new system, on my Windows 10 system, just to keep track of the writes that are being done to the drive, I set up a spreadsheet. And so every month or so, when I think about it, I look at Hard Disk Sentinel, look at the total writes to the hard drive, to the SSD, and then fill in the hard drive data so I can see about how much uh, how much data is being written. You can see that the, the bytes per day that are being written in the far right column, pretty consistent, right around 20 megabytes a day. And it's taken probably more than a year for the health to go down by 1%. So that should tell me that at that rate, I have about another 99 years of health in, in the drive. Uh, in the case of a drive where you're seeing too much wear, where hard disk Sentinel, is telling you that the drive is being worn out too fast, it's really worth investigating that and, and seeing, looking at the Process Explorer, looking at Task Monitor, looking at other tools that you can use to see what's going on in your, in your computer to see why it's being written so hard. Here's the main display for a hard drive for rotating memory. Uh, again, this shows the summary data, how long it's been powered on, uh, estimated remaining lifetime. This is an older drive, and so it's only estimating 100 days, more than 100 days. But looking at the health, so far, there's there's nothing to worry about. Hard Disk Sentinel didn't find anything that was of, of any concern. If you suddenly see changes in hard drive temperature, it's worth looking at that also. And you can go back in time to see the temperature over days, weeks, and months so that you can look for patterns 
uh, in the in the temperature of the of the storage device. Variations are okay when a system is sitting idle. The temperature will go down a bit when you're being very busy on the system. Temperature will go up, especially for example if you're doing a backup. Uh, that will make the drive very busy while it's being backed up, and that will sometimes push the temperature into the orange zone. But that's not a matter of concern as long as it settles down when the drive starts to relax. Modern storage devices, both rotating memory and solid state devices, have what's called a smart display. This is internal intelligence in the drive that tracks many dozen very detailed aspects of the drive. And the bottom line is that SMART is the, uh, is the lab test for your storage device that gives you all sorts of information that lets you drill down deeper to see how healthy the drive is. Uh, this, is the, this is the information display uh, for one of the hard drives. And again, it gives you all of the details, the manufacturer, the topology, the firmware level, how the uh, how the platters are are formatted, most of this is really not necessary to understand for day to day use of storage devices, but it can come in very handy if you need to have your computer worked on. Um, it's very handy for a technician to be able to look at this and immediately know all sorts of details about your storage device. The reasons for using uh, hard disk Sentinel is basically to get a window into the health of, of your device. It lets you detect, analyze, report reliability indicators. Most important, it lets you anticipate drive failures. Even though storage devices for many years have had the smart facility, most operating systems, including Windows, don't disclose that information. They don't look at the drive for the information and present it to the user in a usable format. Over the years, probably two or three times, different monitors have alerted me to problems that were going to happen in my storage devices. For a while, I ran Norton System Works, Norton 360, uh, which is a comprehensive suite of utilities, including a hard disk monitor. And Norton told me that my hard drive was failing. And so I was able to replace the drive and mirror it and copy all my data before the drive actually failed. Uh, same thing, as I mentioned on my Windows 7 system, Hard Disk Sentinel was warning me that the health of my storage device was decreasing at a precipitous rate. And that let me migrate as I needed to to Windows 10 before there was any risk of. Uh, of losing data. One of the reasons for using Hard Disk Sentinel as opposed to other monitors is the dedicated developer. Uh, Janos Mata is a, a fellow in Europe. He is absolutely passionate about this product. I've never used anything that had better support from a developer. When, when I ask him questions, he'll answer my question and then often give me a two or three or four paragraph tutorial on the background of the area in which I asked the question. And he just loves this product and he loves helping people. He loves answering questions. It's very actively supported as new operating system versions come out and new storage media are developed. He's right on it and uh, uh, very responsive and providing current support. The list price for Hard Disk Sentinel is a bargain. Uh, you can buy a license for one system. You can buy a package for five licenses. And this is a lifetime license that gets you free unlimited updates and it gets you lifetime support. And I've actually told him that I think he should charge more and he just laughs and he says he likes developing it and he likes making it available to people. And so he's not interested in, in raising the price. And in fact, he has offered a discount for APCUG user group members, which is a 30% discount off his already bargain prices. So it's really, I think, a no-brainer to be able to buy this, install it on, on uh, 
any Windows system so that you can pay more attention to the health of your devices. Uh, these are these are two very wordy paragraphs from the website, basically just describing what it does uh, and and uh, telling you all the different different things that it does, all the different features that it does. More description of how it works, what it does. Uh, this is a, a comparison chart showing the different versions of Hard Disk Sentinel. You can download a free trial version, and you can see from that left-hand column that gives you the basic information, but not uh, not much more. Uh, the three other versions, Standard, Professional, and Enterprise, have the green checkmark columns going much further down. And as you'd expect, Professional includes more than Standard, and Enterprise includes more than professional. The discounts that he is offering are on the professional version. That's what I've been using. And that really is uh, the, the, the best uh, version for normal consumers to use. It gives you lots of information, but does not give you the unnecessary features that, uh, that the enterprise uh, version does. And that's it. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you very much. I appreciate that because I bought it uh, from with, with the first discount we got. This is our th this is the third one that he's brokered, and uh, I've had I'm one of those people who have had two hard drives die. I know a lot of people say, "Oh, it's never going to happen." You know, it never has happened to me. There's absolutely no reason for me to buy something like that. Well, you, when your hard drives die, the only thing you can hope is that you have it totally backed up. And I found out uh, the first one is my, when I turned my computer on, my hard drive was making strange noises. And so I called my brainstorming duo, president of the Long Beach group, and it was just before the Southwest Test Conference. And he said, turn it on, put your phone down there, let me listen. And he said, kiddo, you better get a new hard drive and get your stuff transferred over. And if it had died and I didn't have a backup, I would have had to cancel the conference. We would have needed to return everybody's money and be in the red because of the money that we owed uh, town and country in San Diego. And a few years later, doggone it, I had another one die. But when it started beeping, this time I knew what to do. So I appreciate this. And my son, one of my son-in-laws, he had an HP uh, computer and that hard drive died within six months. And it was a bad hard drive. So for the amount this is, it is an excellent invest investment. And I do have some questions for you, Gabe. Go ahead. Can this recover data from a failed rotating hard drive? Did you hear me? I did not. Your sound broke up. And also, would you remind people the questions go to you, not to the speakers? Yeah, thank you. Um, preschoolers pay attention better, remember? Uh, that's interesting because your, your sound uh, broke up also. Uh, he, th this person wants to know if data can be recovered using this product. It's, it's No, this, this, is, this is not a recovery tool. This is just a monitor analysis display tool. Uh, that you can use like your check engine light in your car to take action uh, on on making sure your data has been backed up and recovering. But it's not a data mover. It's not a backup. It's not a restore. Okay. Do you have a one? Do you know of a program that does that? There are myriad tools to do that, and I'm not an expert in it, so I won't comment on that, but there are many, many tools ranging from what's built into Windows to lots of different, uh, lots of different backup and restore tools. Yep. This person says, oh, my main display doesn't turn up, turn up when I turn my computer on. 
Uh, that doesn't sound like a storage problem. That sounds like a display problem. Okay. Any idea how to, for him to fix that with HDS? Uh, no. If the display, if the monitor doesn't turn on, first thing I would try is another monitor. Reinstall. Monitors it? fail too. Would it Monitors help? Monitors fail reinstall just like it? storage devices do. Okay. And you don't know. You don't. You don't, Often you don't get you don't, you don't get a warning when your monitor is going to fail. So it's often good to have a spare monitor. Okay, let me let me so, jump in because I think the question is yeah, the HD the Sentinel monitor. Oh, yeah. oh, not the monitor monitor. He doesn't used to start uh, up showing the main display, but now I can't access the main display at all. The green squares for each disk are still there. I say reinstall uh, it. That's always a good choice. Sometimes, mm. sometimes just rebooting will will make problems go away. It doesn't analyze them, but it makes the problems go away. Um, I've not had that not had that problem. And as I said, the developer is very responsive, and so his email address is available in the in the product, and certainly uh, his contact information is on the Hard Disk Sentinel website. And so I would suggest. Uh, emailing Janos, the developer, and see what he says. Keep in mind that he's in Europe, and so that's a that's a time zone difference. And so sometimes I'll send a note, and I'll I'll get a note the following day when he gets it. Steve wants to know: Is it better to set integration as a service or application? I don't understand that question. We'll address that after the end of the presentations and Steve can expand on it. Do we know how much RAM the software tool uses when it's enabled all of the time monitoring the devices? Could this be negative? Uh, I, I'm, I'm on my iPad right now, not at my PC, so I can't ask it, but it's not a very heavy footprint. Um, it's a very elegant program. It does a lot and does not, it's no nowhere near the heavy burden heavy footprint of something like Norton 360, uh, Norton System Works that I had been been using. Uh, it does use some resources, but not much. I find that also it uses hardly zero resources for me. Um, I will be sending every all the attendees an article or a little review that Gabe has written, and it will have uh, the links to the discounts. You just click on the link and boom, it's right there for either product. Oh, just one other one other point I meant to mention is that with the professional version, you can create a portable copy of it that you can put on a thumb drive. And so if you're like a lot of people, as, as I am, uh, supporting other people's computers, doing tech support for other people, you can have a portable version that you bring with you on a thumb drive install temporarily on the computer so you can look around just to see the health of the storage device on that computer you're visiting. Uh, is Thunderbird's email storage system likely to cause excessive writes if one has a large collection of email? Um, I have Thunderbird. I use Thunderbird for my email client. I use Firefox web browser mostly. And on my Windows 10 system, I am not seeing excessive writes. And on the Windows 7 system, where I was seeing excessive writes, I could never pin it down. And there was no sign that Thunderbird was uh, doing anything out of the ordinary. Okay. Paul, it's a buy it once forever, free updates for life. Absolutely fantastic customer service. Auto update. Or do you need to check for updates? I'm, I think you get notification. I think you have to click to update it. But I believe that when I start it, it tells me that there's a new version available. And I actually prefer that. I would rather update software myself when I know that I'm doing that rather than have it done under the covers because I don't like surprises. I don't like anything looking different that 
I didn't expect. And so I'm happier having it tell me, okay, there's a new version, you can install it, and 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 then I do. And the new versions are, are not terribly often. It's not like some other uh, programs that seem to be updated much too often. This is probably uh, two, three, four times a year at most. And so I'm happy being notified, but doing the update manually. Uh, is this product similar to SpinWrite by Steve Gibson? I think that SpinWrite is more, it, it actually does more in terms of manipulating the drive. This is really just a monitor. This does not do anything to the drive. It just tells you all about the drive. I believe that SpinWrite can also fix some problems, uh, which is not something that Hard Disk Sentinel does. It's a good pair of programs to use together uh, where HDS may tell you that something is wrong and Spin uh, might be able to fix the problem. And it works with Mac? No, Windows, Windows only. Windows only? How about Linux? What part of Windows only is not clear? Really? Because well, let me say I need to interrupt Gabe yes, and say as much, John? <laughs> as, as much as I like the program on a Windows, it does have a Linux version that is probably somewhere between the trial and the standard. Uh, it's a graphical program that is more text-based, uh, does not do as much because it's free. Uh, so yes, uh, for the Linux users, there is, and uh, it probably will be demonstrated at the November Learning Linux workshop. Outstanding, John, because we have, I got in touch, or somebody got in touch with me and said she can't, she, it works with her dual boot, but it will not work with her uh, all Linux. So I asked her to send him um, an email and ask about it. So then it doesn't monitor NAS drives either. Correct. I don't know why it wouldn't. It's an external drive, right, Gabe? Right. Okay. If, if it if it if it can see it, if it's mounted, again, I can only speak to Windows. But again, if it's mounted uh, for Windows to use, uh, I believe that it would uh, would handle it. Oh, good. The guy's going to reinstall it. That's in my, you know, troubleshooting 101 presentation. Thank you for smiling, Lynn. I appreciate that. Unplug and replug back everything and uninstall, reinstall always helps. Um, we had questions about the price. I will um, look at the website and see. I know it's the, the discount price is $19.50 for the single issue. And I think the five is like 40 something. But again, when you click on the links that the uh, that you're going to receive from me, it goes right to where you can buy it. Thank you much, Gabe. Appreciate it. Over to John. And I'd like to thank Gabe very much for doing that, uh, especially teaching me what all it can do besides just that first screen. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter for discussions about health apps for Apple devices. Jerry Rogan is our Apple person, and he's going to be sharing with you today lots of information about the health apps. Jerry, it's over to you. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everybody. Today's presentation it's impossible to show everything that these health apps can do in the allotted time. And I'm sure Bill's gonna do the same as I and try and hit some high points. But what our goal in this presentation is to give you an idea how you can collect all of your health data in one location so it's easily accessible. And, and I'll go through the Apple part and I don't look at Bill as a competitor today. He just has an option for non-Apple users. so. We'll go ahead with that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start my uh, PowerPoint. See it? 
All right, did everybody see it? I need to get yes. rid of these views, okay. Well, welcome to the Apple Health app. Now, this gathers health data from your iPhone, your Apple Watch if you have one, other applications that you may already use, and it can also collect data from your physician, uh, your hospitals, and so forth. Data can be shared with those, so we're going to go over that very quickly. Well, I thought we would. Okay, here we go. For some reason, my I'm not getting my clicks in here right. Okay, health puts important information at your fingertips, including your health records, medication, labs, activity, and sleep, and makes it simple to securely share that information with a family member or with a physician or what have you. Is your information secure? That's one of the things we all worry about with HIPAA and all these other things. We wanna make sure our medical information is, is secure. And it absolutely is. Um, the health app is built to keep your data secure, protect your privacy. Everything is encrypted, except one thing that I'll tell you about in a moment. But it is fully encrypted, so it's very, very secure. First thing you'll do when you get into the Apple Health app, and, and uh, you know, I, I need to back up just a little bit. I wanted to tell you what you need. I skipped over that. The Health app is basically on your iPhone, and it's very useful in itself, but if you happen to have an, uh, an Apple Watch, it becomes really, really super important. So I just wanted to make sure you, you knew that. But the first thing you'll do when you'll start this app is you're going to enter some medical data. And this is specifics about your health. Like you'll enter your name, uh, your date of birth, uh, any medical conditions you might have, allergies, medicines, blood type, weight, height. And finally, and you can't see it all here, but you can also enter emergency contacts which can be very important and for a number of reasons. This information is the only information that is not encrypted by Apple. And the reason is that first responders can easily access this if they have your phone. If you should pass out somewhere or have a heart attack or whatever, and if your iPhone is on you, the first responders know how to get this information, which could be critical. What data can the Apple Health track? Here's a basic thing, and I'm not gonna go every, over every item, but it can track your activity. Yes, it does more than count steps. You can, you can track how many calories you've burned, how many flights of stairs you've walked up, how far you've walked. It can also track numerous health category, exercise categories, biking, rowing, and things like that. We'll look at that again in a little bit. Uh, body measurements, yeah, I just put huge and I leave it at that, but you can get very detailed on that. Cycle tracking, I don't think there's probably too many watching today that need that, but that would be if you're trying to get pregnant, you can watch your menstrual cycles and that will help you get pregnant. And uh, while I may look like I am, I'm not, so I really don't use that. Hearing, you can set it up. Uh, to, de to let you know if you're in an extremely loud area where you should have some kind of hearing protection and so forth. I happen to uh, shoot handgun competition with the Illinois State Police. And uh, even with even though I put on earmuffs and, and earplugs, uh, I still get a warning on my phone that, that I'm in a very loud area. So heart, there's a number of heart issues we can track and we'll look at that. Mindfulness, I don't pay a lot of attention to. Uh, it, it, Get you to breathe so many times a minute and try and relax. Mobility is important. It'll track whether you have a tendency to fall or, or so forth. Nutrition, respiratory, sleep. We're going to look at some of these later on. Symptoms, vitals, and other data. 
it just can track almost everything you would need to track as far as your health goes. When you get to the health records, you can track things like allergies, your clinical vitals, conditions, immunizations, lab results, medicines, or medications, and procedures. I'm gonna talk about this just for a minute. For example, immunizations, uh, I went to the doctor this spring and got my, my spring checkup, and I had gotten my uh, second booster for COVID. By the time I got home, my doctor's office had entered that, and it automatically came into my Apple Health record, so it, it shows that I received that immunization. Um, lab results, sometimes we go to the lab, and you know, we might be concerned about one or two particular things. Um, frequently, the same day, we'll get our lab results, and in, in the lab, we'll post it directly to um, the Apple Health. So I think that's fairly critical to know that they can. You have to grant them permission and ask them to do that. Uh, very simple to do. But then everything starts to populate automatically. And earlier, the previous screen, when I was talking about mobility and, and activity, if you have your iPhone in your pocket or strapped to your arm or whatever you do, Without the Apple Watch, it will still track your activity, the calories burned, how far you've walked. Uh, as far as mobility goes, it can track whether you're stumbling a little bit and it might warn you that you're, it looks like you're getting ready to fall. Um, those can be tracked on the phone itself without the iWatch. Medication reminders and more. This is part of the iOS 16 that just came out this week for the uh, iPhone. Health can remind you when they're to be taken on your iPhone and on your watch. Health also has the capability to monitor harmful drug interactions. So when I downloaded iOS 16, I went ahead and put in, I've only got a few drugs, but I went ahead and put them in and the time I'm supposed to take them and Sure enough, my Apple screen would pop up like the right side of your screen looks, and it says it's time to take this tablet. You can say skipped or you can say taken, and it will keep track of that for you. It's, a, it's an excellent reminder, and it will remind you if you don't click on it in so long, it'll come back and remind you again. And probably like most of you, I used to just use an alarm to go off at noon to remind me to take a pill. Well, now I'm just relying on the uh, Apple Health app to do that for me. Managing your sleep is a dream. I only wish it was because I'm one of those people who has difficulty sleeping. Um, but you can priori prioritize your sleep. You can see how long you sleep. Uh, you do, in, in order to do that properly, you do need to put your Apple Watch on. But with the Apple Watch and with iOS 16, uh, you can also see what kind of sleep you're getting. If you're getting uh, REM sleep, core sleep, deep sleep, or if you're awake. And oddly enough, that little chart that's shown on this example pretty much matches my sleep pattern last night. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting to look at. It will also tell you your respiratory rate while you sleep. Um, Again, I think that's important to note. And at this time, I'm gonna tell you that these things we're looking at can be easily transmitted to your physician. If he doesn't have the ability to receive that, you can take your iPhone with you on your next visit to his office and show him these things. Uh, they've become quite credible and uh, the doctors have learned to, to look at it and appreciate that information. This is a biggie for some of us uh, who are getting a little older, AFib, um, atrial fibrillation. If you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, uh, the Apple Watch can warn you that something's going on. Uh, and you can track that in the health app. It will, it will remember how many times you have an AFib event and so forth. Extremely critical for those of us uh, 
who I guess I'd, I'll call ourselves seniors, uh, where AFib becomes more, more uh, prevalent. Really important, and it's with the Apple Watch, uh, the new update that we got this week, they've actually improved. We've, we've always had uh, irregular heartbeat warnings for AFib. They've greatly improved that with this system. And uh, it, yeah, as far as I know, it works great. I do know two people who have an Apple Watch whose AFib was diagnosed on the Apple Health app went running to the doctor and sure enough, they had AFib. So, and I have another friend who it just came up and said, you don't have AFib, but you have a problem. And it, he had something called, I think it was PCV. And I guess we all have it and it's nothing to be concerned about, but the Apple Watch did pick it up. When you put all of this data in, again, it's all encrypted except for the medical data. Uh, it's all encrypted. And if you wanna share that with somebody, you can go to share and you can say, I wanna share this information, but not this information. You can share whatever information you'd like and then designate who you want it shared with. So you can share medications, your blood glucose readings, walking steadiness, cardio fitness, uh, just all sorts of things. And to facilitate physician discussions, you can create a PDF of your available health records. So I say, if your doctor doesn't have the ability to electronically accept what you're sharing, you can print it out in a PDF and take it to his office. And I think that's critical. And we all know we get into doctor's office before we went in, we have 10 questions in our mind, but by the time we get in there, we can only remember two of them. Print it out on a PDF and it's there. Okay, it does work with systems that doctors already use. Again, we, you can share information with them. Uh, I had a little hard thing of about two months ago. I actually used my Apple Watch to take an ECG. It came out on my Apple phone. I immediately transmitted it to my physician and he called me and said, come on in. And I went in and everything was fine. I just had gas that day, I guess. But you do get notified of it and you can immediately notify your physician through the, their electronic systems. A little bit of what I'm already talking about. Um, if you go in and you, you get an immunization, they have the ability to come in and update your health data through the uh, Apple Health. Um, medication records they can send in, immunizations and, and lab results. So and usually when you had lab results, you wouldn't get those lab results until you went in to see the physician. Now they're transmitted to you as soon as they're, they've gotten them and then the doctor reviews them and he'll call you and so forth. So it's a slick, slick system. Institutions can issue verifiable lab results and immunization records, including the COVID-19 test results and vaccinations. They can then be downloaded and stored in your health app. So besides the Apple Watch that we've briefly talked about, what else works with health? Here's a listing of some devices that work with Apple Health. And Judy and I had gotten a question earlier about a I believe it was a heart monitor that had been implanted. Uh, there are a number of third-party devices that work with Apple Health. If yours isn't listed here and you want to know if yours does, I suggest you contact the manufacturer of the device. And if you don't know who that is, contact your doctor, your physician, and ask them. I've never heard of most of these. Uh, of course, Bill's going to talk about the Samsung Health, which I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, oh, I also want to tell you, uh, you, can you link the Fitbit to the Apple Health? Yes. You can download your entire Fitbit history and store it on your iPhone in the Apple Health app. So um, Fitbit will work as well as the Apple Watch. I don't think it's good, but it will. So let's look at the iPhone Apple Watch integration quickly. 
on the right is a picture of my watch face, my Apple watch face. And you can see it's, it's, they call these things complications, but I have messages, EKG, ECG, weather, activity, heart rate, and calendar. All of these are on my watch. Uh, blood oxygen is on my watch. I have the ability to take these things and transmit them immediately to Apple Health if they're not already transmitted automatically. Touching uh, the activities icon, which is down here in the lower right corner, I can select indoor, outdoor walk, golf, dance, outdoor cycle, elliptical hiking. It goes on and on and on. There's a whole list of exercises. When you begin, touch that little green guy, select the exercise you have. It will start tracking movement, calories burned, and so forth. Apple's got these rings that we just call the famous rings. But inside is, is stand. It wants you to stand 12 hours a day. Um, you know, it's it's amazing at, at my age anyway, it's very easy to sit on a sofa for two or three hours and say, gee whiz, where did the time go? The Apple Watch will remind you to stand and walk around for a couple of minutes. That's that blue ring. The, the green ring is exercise where you're actually extra doing you could be doing jumping jacks. In my case, I ride my bicycle and, and that detects that I'm riding and it, it'll track that. And the move ring tracks the calories burned and you can set these goals to whatever you want. You can also see what your activity is, 7,000 steps, 4.63 miles and so forth. So that's what activity can do for you. There's an icon for heart rate. You can see it here on the right. Touching this icon will allow you to monitor your heart rate. Uh, if I'm riding in hills on my bicycle, and I, I try to ride 15 miles every couple of days, if I'm going up hills, I do watch my heart rate. If I get up to 120 or 130, when I get to the top of the hill, I stop and, and recover a little bit. That heart rate is automatically transmitted again to the Apple Health app. But on your watch, you can see what your current heart rate is, uh, what your resting heart rate is, and so forth. It's kind of about, I, I often tell people, you don't buy an Apple Watch to tell you the time. You're buying a computer to go on your wrist that happens to tell time. Okay, one of the other things that's on my watch is ECG, EKG. Touching this icon will allow you to record your ECG EKG, which will be transferred to the Apple Health app. And then you can share that with your doctor if you wish. And it will tell you the, the beats per minute and uh, whether or not you have sinus rhythm or irregular rhythm. Uh, it'll tell you all of that. So you take an EKG and you feel like something wrong or something might be right. Um, this is what your ECG looks like from your watch when you put it on your laptop or on your iPad or whatever. You can then transmit this directly to your physician, which is what I did when I had my problem. Now, uh, Sue, my partner, has had AFib and she had a, an ablation, I believe it's called. And her doctor wanted to implant something in her chest. I can't remember what it was called, but it would monitor for AFib. And she said, well, I have an Apple Watch with EKG and everything. And he said, they, you don't need the implant. So we were very happy to hear that. Irregular heartbeats. Uh, yeah, again, I mentioned that, that Apple Watch can detect that for you and it, and it will notify you immediately that you're showing signs of AFib. One of the things, unfortunately, that, that I've seen happen on me and I've seen happen on, on Sue, my partner, is fall detection. Um, sometimes you've fallen and sometimes you haven't, but when if you do fall, you'll get this on your watch. You'll say, it looks like you've taken a hard fall. You want emergency SOS? I fell, but I'm okay. Or I did not fall. If you don't touch this within, I believe it's 30 seconds, 
immediately emergency people will be notified. They'll be given your location and they'll be sent to assist you. Uh, those of us who are a little older, uh, that's fairly important. I happened to fall off my bike the other day. Um, actually, I was turning into my driveway and a car came speeding up the street right at me. And I kind of had to move quickly and I ended up dumping my bike. Um, I got the fall notification and I just had to touch. I fell, but I'm okay. And that ended everything. So something to keep in mind. Blood oxygen testing, Apple Watch can now... Uh, the newer, I believe it's from the iWatch 7 and 8, can monitor blood oxygen. Maybe the 6 can too, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, you can take your blood oxygen. Again, when you do it on your wrist, it's automatically transmitted to your iPhone. So if you have a blood ox problem, that's a wonderful tool as well. And these tools have all been approved by the FDA. One very important thing to remember. When you complete any of the medical tests, pulse, EKG, or blood ox, the results are automatically sent to Apple Health on your iPhone, so you'll have a permanent record in your info. And this can be shared with your physician. I can't stress that enough. There, a lot of your activity is also shared with your health app. Additional Apple Watch features and capabilities. It's a phone, of course. It can duplicate your phone notifications. It has emergency SOS should you need it. You can listen to audiobooks, do email, photo, sleep monitor, weather, stock monitored. Forget that stock monitored, by the way, after yesterday. Uh, a tip calculator, podcast, and much, much more. One of the things rumored, and Ron Brown and I talked about this, I, I assume some of you know Ron from uh, Tech for Senior. Um, Apple's been talking about a blood glucose monitor built into the Apple Watch. We think it's probably going to be two or three years ahead of competition, but it may be another year or two before the FDA finally approves it for Apple. But in the test lab at Apple, it does work, and it's fairly accurate. I was impressed when I saw it. So uh, something to keep in mind that, that may be coming in the future. So those of us diabetics, we can quit sticking our fingers so much during the day. So again, I call this the dynamic do. If you if the Apple Health app by itself is really critical, it does a wonderful job. But when you tie it into that Apple Watch, you really have the dynamic duo. Okay, if you've got any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat room and just put a J in front of them and Judy will answer it. And I thank you very much. And Jerry, we thank you for a well-planned and uh, informative uh, presentation. It's difficult to, and Bill's gonna do the same thing. It's difficult for both of us to cover everything that can be done. So we're just trying to show you the high points. Yeah, and you, you didn't touch the low points of the uh, cost factor. <laughs> Depends what watch you buy. <laughs> The Apple Watch, uh, the, of course, the, the uh, Apple Health app comes with every iPhone you buy. Um, the iWatches started, the brand new one started about 388 and go up. Everybody saw about the new uh, watch called Ultra that's over a thousand bucks. Yeah, I'm going to wait for one of my kids to buy that for me. I need to talk to John's son and see how he got him convinced. What about, about you, you figure if you buy a brand new Apple Watch, about $400, if you buy it used, you can get them for $200, $250 on Amazon. Uh, okay, I, thank I you, do, everybody. Appreciate it. I do have some questions. I needed to wait because somebody had asked a question and my Google friend over here answered it and he had quite a lengthy answer. Uh, here we go. read up the top here. I'm an old man. You got to keep them simple. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My Apple Watch likes to tell me to stand every hour while I try to sleep. I'm assuming the underlying question is, is how do I stop that from happening? 
I don't know if you can stop it, but if you're sleeping, you can mute your phone on your watch and you won't be bothered. Okay. Can first responders get your critical info even though your phone automatically locks? The first responders get your medical data, which is your height, weight, and we'll pause is that, is that me or is that jerry that's jerry jerry you're cutting out we're getting like every 10th word he's frozen in time isn't he yeah real drap Hmm. The, the dreaded Wi-Fi. Yep, the dreaded Wi-Fi. It's okay. Well, so there's like two of them. Uh, he's yeah. back. He's back. Okay. Okay. You can hear me now? Yeah. All right. Um, the iPhone, the, the first responders are all taught how to activate it, even if it's locked. And they'll come up with a button on the bottom of the screen that says, and when they touch that, that's when they will get your medical data. And that's the only data that they can get. Your Which height, your, your weight, your age, your allergies, your meds, your blood type, that sort of thing. Which model Apple Watch do you have? I happen to have an Apple Watch 7. Oh, okay. And I, I see no need to upgrade to the 8. And that will take the new iOS uh, 16? Well, the, I think the Apple Watch iOS is number 9 right now, but yes, it's, it's the current update. Okay, very good. Those are my questions. I have a question about Android, but I'll save that for Bill. All right. Th thank you, everybody. Appreciate the, the opportunity. Thank you. I'd like to thank Jerry for taking his time today to... Uh, share with us a lot of good information. At this time, I would like to welcome our next presenter, Bill James, a friend of all, who is our Android specialist along with Windows. He is going to be sharing today information about the Samsung and its health app information. So, Bill, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Jerry. And good morning, good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen if I can, and I can. And uh, the smartwatches um, that you are, are available, they are definitely not your father's watch in terms that um, their digital interfaces may mimic the expensive watch faces that your grandfather possibly wore or faces that you are familiar with, but the similarity definitely ends there. These new watches pack lots of tech, heart rate monitoring, ECG, bioelectrical independence uh, analysis, what they refer to as BIA, Continuous blood oxygen saturation and so forth. Sam, uh, the Samsung watch that I'm going to be discussing today is the Galaxy Watch 4 Classic. Uh, Samsung has also introduced a newer version uh, in August of 22, which they call the Galaxy Watch 5. The newer watch has a larger battery and a few other refinements that the Galaxy 4 does not have, for instance, fast charging. But interesting enough, both versions of these watches are available for sale, with the Watch 5 being the up here. So uh, getting set up uh, and to know your um, Samsung Watch 4 Classic, you'll find in the box, you'll get a quick start guide, power cord, though you need your own USB port or power adapter. 
To set it up, you need to download the Galaxy Wearable app, the Samsung Health Monitor app, and the uh, Samsung Health app on your phone. Once you do that, the Galaxy Wearable app will automatically start searching for the devices to add, and it will then display on the watch screen uh, the a number which you're asked to confirm. So you can see that here on the watch, there is a number that's Q, um, M, W, V, and so those have to match. So once you do that, your watch is then here. So just like uh, any other feature-rich smart watch, you must spend some time exploring the watch forward to figure out where everything is and what it does. You can navigate its interface in several ways with white taps on the screen, the physical buttons on the side of the watch, the rotating pencil, the gesture controls, and also it has uh, voice by Bixby for voice recognition. The watch face, you can swipe left to access the various tiles, including daily activity, workout tracking, body composition, sleep, weather, calendar, ECG, heart rate, and stress. Swipe right for notifications, swipe down for quick panel menu to enable the bedtime mode, the always on display, connect the Bluetooth headphones and more. And as you swipe up, that would include your Google Maps, your Play Store, your Samsung Health, your Samsung Pay, Bixby and others, which you can organize as you like. You can easily change, customize your watch faces with the Galaxy Wearable app. If you don't like any of the default options, there are many more available uh, to download from the Play, Google Play Store. The Samsung Galaxy Watch 4 has gesture control and accept calls by waving your forearm up or down, and you can dismiss calls, notifications, and alarms by rotating the, uh, your wrist. So the Samsung Health Monitor app is um, available once you pair it. You launch your Galaxy wearable application on a comparable Galaxy smartphone, and then you pair your Galaxy Watch uh, following the directions from the app. And what happens for the uh, is that the Health Monitor will record your ECG. You can use the Health monitor to record your ECG for informational purposes, the standard uh, lead one ECG. You can check your heart rhythm, text your recorded ECG for the presence of atrial fibrillation, one of the most common forms of irregular heart. Uh, also available on compatible Samsung phones. It's the Samsung Health Monitor, which in, uh, enables you to report. Also enables you to share your ECG report with your healthcare provider. So you also can measure your body composition on the health front. The Watch Four series has a new three-in-one bioactive sensor which not only can read your heart rate and take ECP, but also access your body composition using a process called bioelectrical impedance analysis. Commonly used in smart scales, BIA involves its sending a low level electrical current to your body to measure fat and other metrics. The BIA current moves quickly through the tissue that contains many fluids and electrolytes like muscle and blood and uh, face resistance or impedance moving through fat. Watch measure the impedance or access your body position. So after a 15 second scan, the watch displays your skeletal mass, your fat mass, your body uh, fat percentage, body mass index, body water mass, basal uh, 
metabolic rate or the minimum necessary energy needed in an active state. And then he shows a graphical uh, inner, uh, display on your watch face. The uh, watch can also track uh, your uh, SpO2 and snoring when you sleep. When you wear it to bed, the watch four will automatically track your sleep duration, ages, wake, light, deep, or REM, and can your, the calories that are burned. In the Samsung Health app, you can op op optionally enable overnight blood oxygen saturation. If you have it paired with a smartphone, the watch will let you keep tabs on your snoring, which occurs roughly in 57% of adult men and 40% in women. You wear the watch to bed, place your phone on its stable surface within two feet of your head with the microphone on the bottom of the headset pointing toward you. When the watch detects your sleep, the phone microphone will listen for your snoring and record that if you have the option enabled. As you can see from the example here, it's um, it's showing how you would have the phone placed on a nightstand and you put your watch and it's recording all the uh, data. And then uh, it gives you a sleep score from zero to 100 based on your post time your sleep cycles, the movements and awakening, physical recovery and mental recovery. It also will measure your blood oxygen level, which is an indication of how effective your uh, blood is carrying oxygen throughout the body. Once measured, you'll be able to view your blood oxygen level and the beats per minute. The health app also supports 95 different workouts, including the following default tracking option, workout training, cycling, elliptical trainer, exercise bike, hiking. The other workouts would include running, swimming, uh, both outdoor and in a pool, treadmill, walking, and using a weight machine. And then you can also browse other workout tracking options with the aerobics, alpine skiing, archery, ballet, baseball, and uh, 28 others that are listed here. The watch also has a fall detection, and it can detect hard falls using an accelerometer. Uh, and after detecting a hard fall, the smartwatch will run for 60 seconds if you do not respond, it will send an SOS message to your emergency contact with your location. The watch also allows you to call the emergency contact if you can do so. The Samsung has uh, also warned that um, the watch may not detect all falls, and even uh, intense physical activity could trigger uh, the symptom. Additionally, the SOS message all function to work. Uh, for that to work, you have to have uh, it paired with a smartphone of a network connection. And no matter which version of the Galaxy Watch 4 you own, the SOS works the same across the board. Essentially, when activated, the Galaxy Watch 4 will send a message, your location, and call your emergency contact, provided that watch is connected. A device with a signal or you have an LTE model. When we say signal, it has to be like Wi-Fi. So it'll send all the information needed in order to get whatever help, no matter what happens. But unfortunately, it will not alert authorities like the Pixel Stick Safety app, and your emergency contacts will still be able to do that for you. Emergency calling, which is on the phone only, when something urgent happens, you probably won't have time to unlock your phone and call 911. If you have a security measure in place, like a pin or biometric security, you can make an emergency call right from the lock room. As Jerry pointed out, most of the first responders know how to uh, 
to get into your phone. So in this case, you just swipe up from uh, your phone screen to be taken to the lock screen and then tap emergency call. A dial pad will appear where you can enter your desired number. Your register emergency contacts will also appear at the top of the screen. I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit. Uh, also, medical information is on the phone, and it's the phone only. You tap the medical information icon that appears at the bottom of the emergency call screen, and the next screen shows all your medical information added to your safety and emergency information. Here's a screenshot. And like um, most people will towards learn about security, um, Samsung has what they refer to as a complete multi-layered security platform that both businesses and individual consumers use Samsung Galaxy smartphone watches or tablets. So every layer of your um, of a Samsung Galaxy device is um, secured uh, through this um, application. Your entire device is safe ordered from inside and out in real time. And so Knox protects the person of data both on the watch and on the phone. So in summary, the Samsung Galaxy Watch is a feature rich uh, regardless of which model you purchase. You can meet your new sleep coach, develop sleep habits with advanced sleep coaching that help you manage your overall quality. You can track the state of your heart, get accurate wellness uh, readings thanks to an improved curve closer to your skin. You can get smarter about your body, get stats that help you be able to be your best with body cut um, right on your wrist, everything from body fat readings to your body mass index. And you can also track your outdoor adventures, whether you're running, swimming, rowing, make the most of every outdoor adventure with the auto workout plan. For more tech, uh, the watches has uh, connectivity through Bluetooth 5.0. You have uh, also the option for Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. It has built-in GPS. NFC, where it will, you can use it to pay bills. Also, if you have a data plan with your uh, smartphone provider, you can connect it to LTE. The watches are also waterproof to uh, current standards, uh, like mill standard 8 and H, which I believe will uh, let you go in depths of like 25 feet without damage to the watch. You get feedback from uh, the microphone, the speaker. There's a little motor that causes vibration as a little And in addition to that, as a bonus, it works as a watch. Imagine. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, show you, bear with me here, while I try to, I'm going to show you the um, watch monitor. Jerry, does uh, the Apple Health app monitor your blood pressure? Not yet, no. Okay, do you use an application to map your walking and or biking? N I use the application that's built into the Apple Watch. You just have to touch one icon to select what you're, if you're walking, okay. hiking, riding, uh, select that, and then it automatically is transferred to the Apple Health app. Okay. This is kind of for both of you. Um, Jerry, let's see if you know the answer. John would like to know, with these devices working as, as health apps, will any health insurance plan help with the cost of the device like it might other durable medical devices? I can't answer that. I've never looked into that. Okay. Bill, have you ever? I don't know the answer to that either. Okay. Then. I'll That's go. something you can check with your insurance, uh, but I don't know of uh, any programs that are all. But 
wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With every, every, because with everything, with the phone and your watch, everything is quite expensive. Now, one of the things that I know that I can answer is that Samsung has all kinds of discounts that they will allow for purchase of Samsung products for military discounts to uh, other discounts. You just have to go on their website to uh, check. But I always take advantage of the military discount. And don't they uh, have a discount if you use their Samsung Pay? Uh, they have that, and they also have uh, other um, discounts, too, that are available, uh, just being a member of, uh, okay. of a... Okay, my best laid plans for you doing a live <laughs> presentation are, isn't going to work, so thank you very much. Well, and... I'm not giving up yet, okay. but go well, on. Let's uh, do some live Q&A. Oh, Scan Medicare covers a basic Fitbit. But that, and Fitbits aren't as, as expensive anywhere like everything else is. Does anybody have any questions for uh, any of the three presenters? Remember to raise your hand with the reactions button so your name will pop up to the top of our list. Oh, it's working. Nope, it's not. Stu. I just wondered when, when uh, either of these watches, when you have enough time to recharge them, it seems like you're going to wear it all night and you're going to have it on most of the time during the day. What's the charging time on these? Well, on the, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say on the Samsung, it's probably about an hour to get it uh, fully charged. Um, the newer one, the, the Galaxy 5, they've really improved uh, the charging. They have fast charging uh, capability on those watches. And uh, you're quite correct. What I do is that uh, I I use mine to really monitor my blood pressure. And so what I do is that when I'm taking a shower, when it's not, when I'm not going to use it, of course, I will just basically set it on the charger. So that will give me at least uh, 25, 30% uh, charge, um, additional charge, because it'll be, uh, uh, probably depleted down to maybe in a fifth. I can I can manage the uh, the uh, the battery life in that manner. You just have to get in a custom of setting on the charger when you're in an activity where you can't really use. Well, the watch wouldn't be appropriate. Like you, you can wear the watch appropriately, like in the power or anything like that. Okay, thanks, Bill. And I. Pretty much agree with Bill uh, on my Apple Watch. If I'm going to take a shower. I'm going in to put my pajamas on. I'll throw my watch on the charger. Cool. Dale, your turn. Yeah, I wanted to know if the watch actually um, monitors the blood pressure or do you use a blood pressure machine and record it on your app? I'm interested in getting blood pressure reading. The um, the Samsung will record your blood pressure and uh, um, send it to what we have on the Samsung health monitor. And then from there, you can print it out or share it with your health provider. You don't need the blood pressure. You won't need a blood pressure machine. You won't need a separate machine? Okay. No. That's what I was wondering. Okay, thank you. And Dale, I will see you this afternoon. Okay. Kevin has a question, Judy. 
Yeah, um, something called cardio arm with your Apple Watch will do your blood pressure monitoring. Steve, go. Yeah, I've got a question for Gabe on the um, hard drive sentinel. Mr. Um, Goldberg, you're up. In the configuration menu, there is a setting there for the integration, which means you can either have it set up as a service or as an application. And I just wondered if he tried the service one and if it works any better than the application one. Gabe is muted. Yeah, what, what can I do for you? Uh, Steve just asked you a question. Ah, sorry, I, I was not focusing on the watch presentation because I have my Apple watch. I'm sorry, repeat the question. Yeah, in the HD um, Sentinel, there is a uh, configuration menu and in there it's got settings for the integration and you can have it set up as a service or as an application. I just wondered if you tried the service one and if it's any better or worse than the application setting. I, I have not, I have not looked at that. Uh, once you start drilling down into a uh, hard disk Sentinel, it's like a Swiss army knife with a thousand blades. And that integration is one of the blades that I have not explored. Uh, there's information, there's help information built into the app. And uh, as I said, the developer is very helpful. And you know, you can ask him a question and he'll answer the question and then go into great detail on the entire context of the area in which you asked the question. But in, that integration is not something I'm familiar with. Okay. Bill, can you unshare your screen? Please? I am, I'm gonna do that. Kevin. Yes, my question's for Gabe also. Uh, Gabe, um, Hard Disk Sentinel sounds like a great tool. Um, I also help people all the time with computers, and I've wanted a tool like this, I think. The differences between the levels, all the green marks, the slide I saw, all the green marks were the same for everything except for the trial. Um, two questions. One, um, what would you recommend, the, the pro versus the enterprise, for being able to take a copy to other people's uh, systems? And two, are there extra features on the pro versus um, uh, enterprise or, or, or whichever? Yeah, the, the, enterprise, the enterprise is a higher level, but unless you're in an enterprise, unless you're doing uh, some kind of group management of tools, you really don't need it for, right. for most people and, and certainly uh, sounds like you do the same kind of tech support, volunteer tech support that lots of us do. The professional will be will be just fine for you. And that's that uh, web page that I copied that from goes much further down. I didn't include the entire page, but at some point there are differences between the basic and professional. But the discount that's being given is for the professional version. And that's the one that includes the, the ability to create a portable copy. And so especially for your purposes, uh, making house calls, uh, you definitely want the professional. Excellent, thanks Gabe, that's, that's just what I wanted to know. I had a feeling the enterprise would be some kind of system management wide uh, thing, but appreciate that and I'll, I'll check out those comparisons. Thanks a lot. Mr. Will, it's your turn. We can't hear you. And you are unmuted. Still can't hear you. Nope, you're muted. You muted yourself. Oh dear. Uh, there you go. 
Oh, okay. You That's have the headphone speakers checked. Well, I just put them on and see if that would help. Yeah. Um, my question is for Gabe. Uh, you've got, for instance, two hard drives in a, in a RAID 1 configuration, and they both die at the same time. And it appears that the controller is absolutely destroyed. Um, can you recommend any firms that will do data recovery if possible, assuming the heads haven't totally destroyed the disks? And yes, I know it's about fifteen hundred dollars, but I'm just wondering if you could recommend anyone. I've I've never used one. Um, there is one that I'm I, I've I've been familiar with, but I'm not in the room where that information is. Um, I think fifteen hundred dollars is a low estimate for what you might end up paying because for a while they were sending me discount cards for a discount of $500. And so anybody that's discounting $500, um, you can probably guess that the price is some modest multiple at least of, of $5,000. Um, I'll give you my email address. If you email me, um, I will, if I can find it, Drive Savers, that was it. It's Drive Savers in California. Um, and all I know is that they are very capable um, and they are very expensive. Well, uh, and, and again, if, uh, I, I'm, that I understand, but if, if you absolutely positively have to get at least one of the two RAID 1 drives back alive, uh, then you pay the Ab money. Absolutely. What, just, just because Drive Savers is the only one I'm, I'm familiar with, that's not necessarily the, the best one for you, what I'd suggest is just go online. There have been write-ups, there have been evaluations and comparisons uh, of different uh, data recovery services. Look at Drive Savers, it's somewhere in California, but also just see what else, see what else there is. All right, well, thank you very much. And actually a suggestion, um, email the fellow who, uh, Janos, Janos Matha, the, the developer of Hard Disk Sentinel, I suspect that uh, in, in the process of developing and supporting his hard drive tool, he has probably come across other people with similar problems needed to do drive recovery. And he might also have some good recommendations based on either his own experience or feedback that he's gotten from other people. Well, again, thank you very much. Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry, it's John's turn. What? There you go. Yeah. Uh, yes, Hard Disk Sentinel. You had mentioned uh, it's been right to work with Hard Disk Sentinel during that uh, presentation. What is spin right and how how does it work? What what uh, what does it do? I should ask. Uh, spin right is from a fellow named Gibson and I forget the website it's not it's not part of or related to hard disk sentinel it's another G utility grc.com right grc.com you'll find spinrite and a bunch of other very interesting valuable powerful helpful and free utilities and I would suggest you go to grc.com and read about spinrite um, it's it's a it, it will help you tune and fix hard drives versus versus hard disk sentinel, which just tells you about them but doesn't do anything. Sorry about the phone. It's uh, yeah. I will go to that website and check them out and see what it see what it does for me. Uh, I just never heard of it before, and I know. Uh, I was just looking at it to see if I could try that first before I ended up buying a new hard drive. The other thing is, for me, is I went out and bought an external hard drive. Uh, and then I used that with a, uh, and then I looked for a backup program. Of course, the flavor of backup program that one gets is up to them. But between the two, I can keep all my information backed up. And if I need to restore it, I can. But that, I was just looking for the spin right. And that was, an, uh, that was the spin right question was for me, you had another 
and gentlemen looking for uh, data recovery. Uh, I, I generally try and use a backup, which I'm well overdue for doing, but backup on an external hard drive would be great, along with the backup program. Maybe we could get a presentation on that at some time in the future, if one hasn't been given lately. But anyhow, one. thank you for the information. We did one in March. John, if I had your last name, I'd be more than happy to send you a link to the video about backing up because there's World Backup Day, March 31st, and I always have a backup presentation for that. Uh, yeah, I, I put that in. I thought it was going to show up, and then I didn't want to go back through and put the last name in for fair score things up. The last name is Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T. -T. Hopefully I'll remember that till after the meeting. Uh, with uh, If you go to grc.com, there is also something where you can check to see if you have any open ports. I did this every three times a year with my students and our high school district always had an open port and I would let the IT department know. They had no clue what I was talking about. They finally got an IT person in there who knew about, you shouldn't really have an open port. And the next time I did it, all the things were green. So that's just something else. And Steve Gibson loves user groupies. He has been around for a thousand years. I believe he also is on some uh, popular radio show all about technology. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to comment on Will's um, dilemma with the RAID 1 drives. Uh, if it's okay to respond to that, uh, I'd like to. Yeah. Um, RAID 1, from my understanding, is disk mirroring, which means those two drives should be a duplicate of each other. Um, I've had uh, a fairly good degree of success in taking a straight Windows drive out of a computer, plugging it into a USB a SATA adapter, plugging it into another computer, but I sometimes have to then, uh, if it's a Windows computer, I have to give it permission to access that drive. It has to set all the bits internally for all the files and folders. It takes a long time to get around that. I just boot my laptop up in Linux and then plug that USB hard drive adapter into Linux and then copy the drive contents to um, another drive, either on that laptop or to an external uh, device. So I just wanted to share that. I didn't know if you had looked at that or not. Uh, I'm simply, if I may, let me just simply say, what is the probability of two one million hours MTBF drives failing at the same instant? When you said the, 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 the what you said was if they were to fail or if the controller had a problem. So if the controller is a single point of failure and that caused Unability to uh, uh, no ability to connect to either of the drives, yeah. then you'd be able to, I think, un disconnect one of the drives. So I assumed you were asking that as a as a regular serious question that you wanted a a, a response to. So oh no, it, it is definitely a serious question, and uh, thank you. Okay, okay. I'd like to chime in. Uh, the probability is good if your power supply is questionable. Kurt, your turn. Uh, I put. I sent you a link, Judy, to uh, on track data oh, recovery. Of, of course, on track. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I had a dealing with that company in one of their their disk management projects or products many many years ago. A thing called Partition Magic, ah. and it really was magic for what it did. <laughs> mm -hmm but they're a very reputable company and on their website, they will give you an estimate. And it's not gonna be cheap, right? Okay, but it's worth a shot. It's merely on track.com. Back in the day, you brought that memories, Kurt. What can I tell you? Partition magic, we, we thought that was great. Yeah, it's called uh, mini tool partition wizard now. <laughs> Uh, I've, uh, Dorothy, 
I just got a question. I was on the hard disk Sentinel website and I can't figure out how as APCUG members you get the discount. Dorothy, I said I'm sending a information out oh, about okay. that. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. And I have some questions for Gabe. And um, one of them is, I've got four physical hard drives, two are SSD, two are not. All are at 100%, but one is at 94%. Is that a bad sign? How far down does it have to go before it needs attention? More than the 94%, I would go back and look at the trends for health. You can, you can scroll backwards in time and see when the drive has been deteriorating. So if it's been 94% for six months and it was 95% for six months before that, you're fine. You can also look at the predicted life of the drive. Mm -hmm. And if it says it's 100 days, uh, that's one number. If it says it's 1,000 days, that's another. But I think the most interesting thing you can do is look at the trend for the health. And if it's going down one one or two percent a year, uh, that's something you can just ignore. If it's going down one percent a month, you probably want to look at that. And if it's anything more than faster than one percent a month, you definitely want to look at it. And again, it depends on the technology of the drive, whether it's rotating memory or an SSD, what might be making the health decline. And there's enough information in HDS so you can see what is driving the decline. If it's a solid state drive, usually what makes the health decline is just wearing it out with data rights. And you, as I said in the, in the presentation, you can look at the total data rights to a drive and watch that as a trend. And if you want to, you can set up a spreadsheet as I did. And so you can see the average data rights per day and there's lots of information you can play with, but I would start with how fast the health is declining. Okay. Uh, this is from one of my members. He says his C drive and SSD is running about 120 degrees. Uh, this drive is on his motherboard directly, uh, directly underneath the video card. What should he do? Um, that seems hot. That's hotter than my drives run. Um, you might look up the specs for the drive and see uh, what it's rated for, but in general, heat is the enemy of electronics. Um, you might look at the health of the drive. Um, if hard disk Sentinel is happy with the health and it's been running at that temperature for some time, you probably don't have a problem. Um, uh, but again, if that's the, the steady state temperature of the drive when you're not doing much, when you're pounding on the drive, like doing a backup, that might drive it even higher hmm. my my backup happens all the time um i don't know if there's any difference uh when you get warnings of periodic heat excursions from hds do you know of any computer monitoring tools ideally that creates log files that might be of help in determining what was causing excursions possibly tools that would log computer events or processes over a period of time to look for coincident periodic excursions. Windows is full of logs. Windows has so many logs, I usually don't even know where to start. Uh, lots of different processes in Windows uh, create logs. You can look at, um, I, I'm, there's one kind of master log that you can look at that will log warnings, problems, catastrophes. Um, it's something like Incident Editor, but I can't remember the name of it, uh, that lets you look at what I have found to be the most useful log. Um, you might or might not track that to temperature. Um, one of the things regarding temperature is that, uh, especially for laptops, they need to get cleaned out every once in a while because they get full of dust and dust is the enemy of electronics. Um, we have two cats. And so my computer service technician usually tells me that he removed about a third of a cat 
uh, every time he cleans my tower computer. Uh, and so that's that might be one way to address higher temperature than you think you should be seeing. Make sure that the fans, make sure all of the fans in your computer are turning. Make sure that none of the vents are blocked and make sure that the computer is not full of dust. I saw some heads nodding while while I was saying that. That's about the most useful thing you can do for, for temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a drive that had health at 66% a month ago and now it's 100%. What, how, how, how did that how did that happen I have no idea um, that is that was that a, a rotating memory or solid state Steve which is it it's a uh, portable hard drive a five terabyte uh, Seagate drive a month so, ago so. It, a month ago it changed from 66 percent to hundred percent so it's a platter yeah um, I, I don't know, uh, possibly some process ran automatically and assigned alternate areas on the drive and decided that was more healthy. Um, you might be able to get some information from hard disk Sentinel, uh, looking down in the deeps of the smart data that's recorded, but usually, um, the health of a drive is only, it's like, uh, you know, how much, how much liquor is in the liquor bottle? It doesn't usually go up. It usually just goes down. Uh, so again, you might ask uh, Janos, the, uh, the developer, mm -hmm. if he's ever seen health go up rather than down. Yeah, I would try that. Gary, you're on. You're muted. You're muted, Gary. Face bar. Sorry, I thought I... <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you're talking about my uh, hard drive before at the 94% the um, health problem. Uh, it, it is an SSD, but when I look at the estimated uh, remaining lifetime, it's, it's 382 days. I've got four physical hard drives, and then I look at uh, one non-SSD drive, and it says health is 100%. But estimated re remaining life is a hundred days. It says more than a hundred days. You know, how do you balance the days with the percent health? Um, I don't know how it calculates that for a plot for for rotating memory, but I suspect that it is looking at things like how long it's been in use. So if you look at that and it's been powered on for thousands and thousands of days, that might affect its best guess for, uh, for, for longevity. Yeah, the power on time for the non-SSD is 1,822 days. Um, yeah, I don't I know if that's I a lot suspect, of I suspect that for, for both rotating memory and solid state devices, uh, a lot of factors go into it guessing uh, the expected lifetime, but you know, I would I would also point out that the guess for expected lifetime is not a guarantee. It's just sort of an estimate of probability. And mm -hmm. if it's a thousand, that's better than a hundred. But neither one of those is a guarantee. Yeah, it's it's just interesting. A, a lot of uh, statistics. It's hard for the user to uh, to comprehend what really to pay attention to. But yeah, uh, yeah. I'll keep watching. <laughs> Thanks. Cal. You're on. Uh, just to reinforce what uh, Gabe was saying about the uh, heat and temperature, uh, it's always a good idea to check the thermal compound on a laptop as well. Uh, I've had success with a MacBook just recently. It was easy to do. Uh, hard drive uh, heat, uh, you can always add a heat sink in the mechanical fan. Uh, Always check those things. And of course, you know, uh, a pet hair, I've had my share of experience with uh, cleaning out from the processor heat sink, uh, half a dog. But yeah, uh, there's that. And in the case of a simple installation of a drive, that is, you don't have a complex network of any kind. 
you can try the manufacturer. Um, I use Kingston SSDs quite a bit, Kingston Technologies, and they have an excellent utility to monitor the health of their own equipment. So there is that option. Not that I'm taking away from uh, hard drive Sentinel in any way, but uh, if you're not looking to put out any money, uh, there's an idea to uh, go to the manufacturer and see what they have for their smart, uh, smart drive utility. Thank you. Kurt. Just a, a comment about temperatures. If that temper 120 degree temperature was Fahrenheit and not Celsius, in my opinion, you can uh, just not worry about it. Uh, if you look at what we do to, to CPUs, where we're using variable speed fans on and whatnot, as long as we're you know somewhere below 100 degrees centigrade, we tend not to worry about it. Uh, when I was in the, in the Navy, I had a transmitter, I think it was a transmitter, yes, uh, where we had part, part of the transmitter was act, actually in an oven that was kept at 160 degrees all the time. Uh, and it was elevated like that just so that it could be maintained at a constant temperature, regardless of the ambient temperature. So 120 degrees uh, in a PC somewhere doesn't bother me at all. The problem is in the cycling. Okay, Steve. You know, I've got a good solution for uh, the dog hair and the cat hair and all the other dust and stuff. What I did was I got, you get a pair of your wife's pantyhose and you cut it to the size of your fans and you stick that on the front of the fan and then clear the dust off of every now and then. And it's amazing how it will clear up the inside of your case. <laughs> Love it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, in my Troubleshooting 101 presentation, I talk about, you know, what you just said. I'm going to add that to it. And the other thing is check your cords and cables. And if you have pets running around, watch out for the dust. And just, you know, like was said, and I have two cats. One sheds like crazy 16-pound tuxedo. And he was rustling around behind uh, my printers. And I wasn't at my computer didn't realize it and then I came over to use it and my TV went boom and everything went down because I'm all etherneted and er everything is on a one search big search protector and he was chasing a lizard and he turned the search protector off and I laughed because that's in part it's my presentation about that might happen if you have animals running around or little kids crawling around so you know, what you make up as you give presentations sometimes happens in true life. Steve. Yeah, that's what I already finished. Okay, thank you. And Gary. Uh, just another word about the heat uh, problem. I've got four physical hard drives and uh, Hard Drive Sentinel uh, shows the, uh, the, the uh, temperatures, but my Western Digital is always about 12 degrees, it records about 12 degrees hotter than the other three drives, even when I just turn it on. So the actual temperature readings might not be, uh, uh, you know, correct. Um, even when I turn them on, it's immediately 12, about 12 or 13 degrees. It shows hotter than the other drives, which are all, all for cold. Kennedy, it's walk us off. What a great workshop with lots of information. You've got two options, a third option. Tie them all together. Stay healthy. Come to another end of a workshop, but yet we still have more to come in September. Next week, we'll have our Learning Linux. We begin a three-part series on uh, Learning Linux from the Windows user's point of view. So it's basically for Windows users wanting to know about Linux. And then you all want to be back the following week because we're gonna have a panel group, multiple people doing a program on home audio systems. 
and that's going to be enlightening for all of you. And as always, we are always looking for more topics and more presenters. As you saw today, you don't have to do a full one. You can do a part of one, be on a team. So unless there's anything else, we will say goodbye and see you next week.